So sad fact, the reason why there is so much information already on this page is because I already worked through all these problems earlier today. Actually, these are the solutions. So this is where I'd work through in green um, all these solutions earlier, several solutions earlier to explain how this works. And apparently I was sharing the wrong page. So I'm going to clear these annotations. I am also going to make sure that I am sharing this. Yes, I am. And we're going to try this again. I am going to stop the video because I'm about to close my laptop and um, you don't need to see it. All right, solving the quadratic equations in vertex form. First things first, um, in solving them in inverse form, as we talked about in class, I see the variable only one time. Um, because of that, well, actually, first I need to re recognize I'm trying to find zeros for these functions. So the output, the y value is zero. And now I have an equation with only one variable visible. And so I can just use inverses to solve this equation. So when we have that vertex form, when we have that variable just once, we're going to, one, I will make this note simplify if possible. Then two, use inverses with properties of equality. It doesn't matter how complicated the equation gets, as long as you understand these principles, you'll be fine. Um, so as I said, inverses. Now a major principle for me when solving an equation is I read from the variable, meaning I have this x here. Because of the parentheses, the first thing happening to x is x plus three. Then following the order of operations, the next thing is my exponents. So x plus three is being squared. Then multiplication and division. And so x plus three squared is actually being multiplied by a negative one here and divided by four all at the same time. And now that we've taken care of multiplication and division, we have addition and subtraction. So the last thing happening is at plus 25. So that's the inverse that I, or that's what I want to undo to try to isolate x to get to just that x. And so I subtract 25 to create a zero. I'm not moving anything. I'm subtracting 25 to create a zero. But Whatever I do to one side of the equation, I have to do to the other. Now, even though this equation looks different from what I started with, by that property of equality, they are equivalent. So the inverse created that zero on the right-hand side. The property of equality made it so that even though these equations look different, they're telling the same story. The same solutions will exist. I'm going to go ahead and multiply by a negative 4 because a negative times a negative is a positive. 4 divided by 4 is 1. And whatever I do to one side of the equation, I have to do to the other. So 100 is equal to x plus 3 squared. I'm going to bring this up here because there's an important principle I want to show. Now, the last thing happening to the x is that square, right? So if I look at x, it's x plus 3 inside of the parentheses then squared. The last thing that I want to undo is the square. So the square root is the inverse of a square. They cancel out, creating that exponent of one. Um, and keep that in mind that with using inverses, we are trying to create either a zero or a one. So make sure that's what you're actually creating. Now, a point of tension for a lot of students, something they forget is if I have x squared equals 16 and I take the square root, sure. 4 squared does equal 16, right? What I'm trying to find is what makes this equation true. Um, and so at the same time, negative 4 squared is equal to 16. So when I take that square root, the calculator is only going to tell me 4. I, as a human being, as an intelligent person, have to remember it's both going to be a positive and a negative. So when I take the square root of 100, I only get 10 but I also actually get a positive or a negative 10. If I were to square a positive 10 or square a negative 10, I get 100. And so if you see that positive and negative above it, it literally just means positive or negative. In this context, in a second, I will show you when it's plus or minus. All right, last thing, right? I've got x 
I just plus three, I need to subtract three to create a zero. And so earlier I had positive negative 10. Now I have negative three plus or minus 10. So is it um, acting as a operation or is it acting as positive and negatives? That's the only thing. Um, but you wanna split it up eventually. Negative three plus 10 gives me seven. Negative three minus 10 gives me negative 13. There's my solutions. And so if I was asking for roots or solutions, you could leave it like that, that bracket notation indicating that. Because I am trying to have X intercepts to sketch a graph, I'm actually gonna leave it as seven zero and negative 13 zero. Remember from earlier, that vertex form of a function, I already had the vertex, I actually already had the concavity, um, the line of symmetry, I could find the y-intercept, but here's where we are. Now, I am going to bring this down here for that extra space. Um, there was something I was going to say with that. Well, I'm just going to bring it down. Oh, the sketching the graph. So the sketching the graph is not essential to this unit, but for many of us who struggled with these quadratic functions, you're gonna have a chance to always show me evidence of understanding again. So we have our quadratic. We wanna recognize that there's a y-intercept, a negative, or sorry, a vertex, right? Negative three, 25. So one, two, three. I'm gonna go by ones on the x, but I'm gonna go by fives on the y. So negative three, 25. I have now just found that my roots are, or my x-intercepts are seven. I'm gonna go by twos on the x, trying to go out to negative 13. So negative 13, zero there, um, seven, zero here, negative three, 25 here. Um, and don't forget, I can also always find my um, y-intercept. Oh, and then there's my line of symmetry at x equals negative three because my y-intercept has an input of zero. I would just made that 25 a common denominator so I could do this by hand. Um, so it's gonna give me 22.75. Not the prettiest graph, but it's got all those features. And that last point that I did was just using that line of symmetry. And so there's evidence of understanding concave down, you got the vertex, got the y-intercept, got the x-intercepts, that's it. Um, and you can do that with all of these different problems. Um, the spicy is just same exact principles, just uh, with slightly more difficult numbers to work with, right? Just undoing the last operation there. With these, you will definitely run into the need to simplify rather than just uh, evaluate. So we'll talk about this in class some, but the square root of 32, that's the same thing as eight times, ooh, let's go 16 times two. I want the highest perfect square possible. So I'm gonna rewrite this square root of 16 times the square root of two. And so x minus two would end up equaling four or positive negative four root two. Add two to both sides and x equals two plus or minus four squared to two. 
I'm totally okay with you leaving it this way. The calculator, Desmos, nope, Matthew, that you're going to work on is going to want more, but I'm totally okay leaving it there. Um, moving on to factored form, the whole beautiful part of factored form is that the only way to multiply numbers and get a zero is if one of those factors is zero, right? So we're finding zeros. And so my output is zero. And again, the only way to get that product of zero is if at least one factor is equal to zero. That's my zero product property. As soon as you multiply by zero, you get zero. So either two thirds is equal to zero, which obviously not possible. X plus two is equal to zero, which we can solve that or x minus two is equal to zero. And you could just use your understanding of roots from the last unit in this case. However, and so there's your roots, your x-intercepts, you can graph it. Um, find your vertex, all that fun stuff. However, I wanna point out that g of x is a little bit different, right? f of x perfectly follows a times x minus r1 times x minus r2. And I can make it so that g of x does, but this 3x changes things, at least in respect to just identifying roots as the opposite of that 6. But the principle of a 0, having an output of 0, has not changed. And once again, I have a product of 0. So either negative 1 half is equal to 0, which it doesn't, or 3x plus 6 equals 0, which it can, or x plus 2 is equal to 0. three X is equal to negative six. Using that reciprocal that I recommend, three divided by three, or that fraction bar just means division. Now again, can you just divide? Yes, but there are mathematical implications using that reciprocal that can help in a lot of situations. So X equals negative two and X equals negative two again. Because that same zero or root showed up, we're gonna call that a double root. Hold on to that because it's gonna show up next unit. Now, factory form, vertex form, very straightforward. If you have vertex form, you see that variable one time, you can use those inverses and properties of equality. However, and if you have factored form equal to zero, then you can use um, the zero product property. The standard form though is a little bit tougher to work with. And so what I'm gonna recommend well, one thing, option is factoring. Because if I can get to a factored form, then I can use my zero product property, especially if, as in this problem, I'm looking for zeros or roots. Now we're trying to sketch the function, right? So well, negative 5, 10, 15, 20. So I'm going by fives. Notice I'm doing this or noting this because I already know the y-intercept is negative 15. I already know that this is going to be concave up, but I want some more details. And so zeros, right? Zero equals 6x squared minus x minus 15. Now over here to the left, I'm going to point out a couple of things. The way that we got to a standard form from factored form was we put our factors up here in those spaces. And then we distributed x times x is x squared x times negative three is negative three x, negative two times x was negative two x, negative two times negative three is positive six. And in case someone's like, where did that come from? Stay calm, just illustrating how we went from factored to standard because now I wanna go backwards, right? I wanna go from that standard to a factored form. And it's important to notice that this is the only tricky part, right? That the x squared stayed x squared, the six stayed plus six. So when I'm trying to, work on this quadratic in standard form, I'm gonna use my area model to back out what I originally had. And so I know I have a six X squared. I know I have a negative 15. However, as we see over here, two different terms gave me that negative five X. And so I have to find out how to get those two different terms in those squares there. Thankfully, there's a strategy called the AC method of factoring. And in the AC method of factoring, you literally take your value A, right, from AX squared plus BX plus C. You multiply it by your C. 
And now you need factors of that product that add up to B, right? Because these two terms have to add up to that B of negative one. And so I thankfully, I've done a lot of this. I noticed right away, negative 10 and nine, those are pro factors of negative 90, they add up to negative one. So I'm gonna have a negative 10X plus nine X. And the mathy assignment that I leave for you will have us doing this as well. However, I will note that that's not that easy for some students to do. And so a foolproof thing to do is just work through your factors, start with the simplest. Now. Simplest factors of 90 or 1 and 90. Now, I know I need a product of negative 90. So at least one of those has to be negative. Well, not at least. One of those has to be negative. They're both negative. I would have a product of a positive. But they need to add up to a negative 1. And so the bigger number needs to be negative. Definitely not adding up, so I'm not using that. 2 and negative 45. Not adding up to negative 1, so not using that. 3 and negative 30. Again, factors of negative 90, but not adding up to negative 1. 4 does not go into negative 90. 5 and negative 18 do, but they do not add up to negative 1. 6 and negative 15 multiply, but they do not add up to negative 1. 7 is not a factor of 90. 8 is not a factor of 90, but 9 and negative 10 is, and those add up to exactly the negative one for the B that we want. Once you have your area model filled in, now you can go in and literally factor out your greatest common factor of each term or of each row and column. A note with that is if you have a greatest common factor for all three terms, that can make things complicated. Make sure you factor out your greatest common factor first for the entire expression. We didn't have anything between six, negative one, negative 15. So we're good to go. Greatest common factor of six X squared and negative 10 X. They both have a factor of two. They both also have a factor of X. Greatest common factor of nine X minus 15. They both have a three and I think that's about it. Greatest common factor then of six X squared and nine X. So notice I'm pulling out those factors from each row and column. Um, they both have a factor of three and they both have a factor of X. And note that should make sense because two X times three X is six X squared. Three times three X is the nine X there, right? Um, negative 10 X and negative 15 both have a factor of negative and five. And again, note two X times negative five is the negative 10 X there. Three times negative five is negative 15. So it's looking like it's rocking and rolling. Um, and so I'd have zero equals 2x plus 3 times 3x minus 5. Using my zero product property, 2x plus 3 equals zero, or 3x minus 5 equals zero. From there, you just use your inverses. I'm running out of room, so I'm just going to write them up here, but x would equal negative 3 halves. And x would equal 5 thirds. And so I can now graph those x-intercepts. Negative 3 halves, 5 thirds. And I could find the average of those roots to find my vertex. I'm genuinely OK right now. I think I did it earlier, but I'm at this point quite ready to go to bed and I've got a few more things I gotta do tonight. Sorry guys, but I've got my concavity. I've got my y-intercept. Um, I know that that y-intercept looks like the vertex. It's not, it's very, very close, but just be aware. I'm, I'm aware that that y-intercept is not the vertex. Yeah, there's more precision here when I did the solutions. Oh, I forgot that I left. Spicy number four in there, okay? So I'm going to explain the work that I did here um, below it. But note in something like number four, what we have are two parabolas. The first one, y equals x squared minus 4x minus 8. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Y-intercept to negative 8. Um, 
and the vertex, if you play around with it, comes up to be two comma negative 12. And so there's the first parabola, roughly. The second one, um, oof. And so this one's actually going to be pretty ugly. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten. I'm just not even the. I know the h would be negative five, but I'm not going in and finding the k. But anyways, I would have two parabolas that would look roughly. Yeah, you know, way too far off. They look roughly like this. And what we're being asked to do is find exactly where these parabolas intersect. Well, wherever they intersect, the y values are the same. So we can just set them equal to each other, substituting x squared minus 4x minus 8 in for y. And so I'm going to solve this equation. First thing first, I got to get my equation equal to 0 so I can use that 0 product property. Okay, so I am setting this equation equal to zero. Zero, zero, zero. And so 2x squared plus 6x minus 20 equals zero. As I mentioned uh, earlier, if there's a greatest common factor, you want to take care of that. Um, and so like 2x squared plus 6x minus 20 all have a factor of two. And so this is going to make my life way easier. And now is when I can go in and use that factoring method that I showed earlier. And that's it. Um, you'll notice that once you find your x values, x equals negative 5 and x equals 2, you have to substitute those back in to get the actual points of intersection. So when x equals negative 5 and you substitute that into the functions, the output was 37. So there's one point of intersection. And here was the other. I think those ended up actually being the vertices of those two different functions. All right, so factoring doesn't always work. Um, so for example, um, I'm gonna look at this first one here. I want it to be equal to zero so that maybe I can use that um, zero product property. Hmm. This one actually, factoring would work. Um, factoring, I think, would be a pain with h of x. So that's what one we're going to work on. So what I'm about to show is just another option. Um, you, factoring is an option that does not always work. It only works when you have rational roots, um, meaning it's a ratio of integers uh, for the values. I will say on this blue one that I just barely started, I noticed a greatest common factor that I would definitely divide by everything. But I'm going to focus on h of x and those zeros. So the output is zero. And so the traditional approach to this one is called completing the square CTS that's down here. It's a great strategy. Um, however, when you complete the square, and I made a note of this in the other video, when you complete the square, you legitimately just end up with the vertex form. So for me personally, it's easier to just identify the A, right? I already have A, A is negative three halves. 
I know how to calculate H, the opposite of B divided by 2A for that standard form. And so the opposite of negative six is six divided by two times negative three halves, which is A. And so H is equal to six divided by negative three or H is negative two. The reason why I like this strategy personally is because I know that if H is my input, K is my output. And so I'm just gonna use my calculator and make my life easy. So substituting negative two in for H, I'm about to get K, negative three halves times negative two squared minus six times negative two minus six, H of negative two is equal to negative six plus 12. So six, six minus six is zero. So apparently this could have factored. I don't know that it would have been very nice. The reason I say that is, um, so I now have H, I now have K, and I know A. So zero is equal to negative three halves, X minus negative two, so X plus two squared, and it's plus zero, but I don't technically need that plus zero. Um, that's actually gonna make my life way easier. So. Remember, this is why I like using that reciprocal um, when I have that fraction like this. But the last being, thing being done, right, x plus 2, x plus 2 is squared. x plus 2 squared is multiplied by negative 3 halves. So I'm going to multiply by negative 2 thirds. That reciprocal creating the number 1. But 0 is equal to x plus 2 squared. Square root. Usually you get two values, but positive and negative zero is just zero. So zero is equal to X plus two. And so we're supposed to get two roots, but I only get one. Well, that's because that one root is the same as the vertex. So if I was trying to sketch H of X, got a Y intercept to negative six, one, two, three, four, five, six. I've got a root or a vertex of negative two, zero. You got my line of symmetry. So two units to the left, I'd have the same point. And so notice my two roots would be that vertex sitting on the x-axis. And so if I want to complete the square, or if I have a standard form and it doesn't look like factoring would be fun, I might go to that vertex form. It takes a little bit more algebra um, than using that factoring method, especially once you get really good at finding those factors of A times C to add to B. But that vertex form, the beauty of it is it does always work. Factoring does not. And so there's more examples down here. These spicy ones, just they're going to give you fractions um, for H and for K, still very doable. But that's why they're spicy. They're a little bit more involved, but very, very doable. Same exact principles. All right, so sometimes you're going to run into situations, though, where you're like, man, I can't factor. For example, um, let me see if one of these will afford me this reality. No. Okay, let me give an example of one that you cannot factor. There are no factors of, let's do it that way, yeah. So A times C would give me 60. I cannot think of factors of 60 that would add up to a negative six. So notice I'm exhausting my list of factors that I could use. Yep, no, no factors of 60 that add up to negative six. So it's not factorable. I could complete the square or use that vertex form, or the final method is this thing called the quadratic formula. Hopefully you remember this from a previous math class, but it's the opposite of B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus four AC all divided by two A. When I get back from Chicago, uh, my goal is to actually derive where this equation came from, just so you can see it at least once, but that is not today. But it's literally just a matter of identifying A, B, and C and substituting in. The only requirement is that your standard form 
has to equal zero. If it doesn't equal zero, this formula breaks apart. So with, for example, medium doesn't work right now. But now I've created zeros on the left-hand side, it works. My A is three, my B is negative 12, my C is negative 15. So X is equal to the opposite of B, so positive 12 plus or minus the square root of um, negative 12 squared minus four times three times negative 15, four AC, all divided by two times A. So 12 plus or minus the square root of 144 plus 180, right? 312? No, 144. Three twenty-four. That makes way more sense. Divided by six, and then it, it, literally once you substitute everything in, it's just a matter of simplifying. Um, I believe the square root of three twenty-four is eighteen. Yes, that's right. And you can do your adding and subtracting at this point. Twelve plus eighteen is thirty. We're still dividing by six. And 12 minus 18 is negative 6 divided by 6. So the zeros here would be 5 and negative 1. Again, the big thing to just remember with this is quadratic formula will always work. But um, it's easy to make mistakes sometimes. Um, there are certain situations where knowing how to go to the vertex form would be more efficient. It's just your preference. However, you will have to show me that you can use at least two methods to solve quadratic equations when it comes to our unit test. Um, yep, showed some of that work there. Um, you will notice down here that if you end up being left with um, radicals, that's okay, right? Um, for this one, got the square root of 28. That's the same thing as the square root of four times seven. So square root of four times square root of seven, I just broke that radicand up, leaves me with two root seven. And I noticed that there's a factor of two in everything, in every term, so I divided everything by two. Um, unfortunately, I don't think this was as detailed as what I did earlier, um, but I hope that this is productive and useful for those of you who are trying to learn how to solve the quadratic equations a little bit.